40% Merlot, 40% oh, Malbec, and 40% Cap Sauce. Oh, it's good for you. Welcome to the Wine Enthusiast Podcast, the world in your glass. In this episode, we're exploring the concept of terroir as it relates to food and how, much like wine, where and how our food is produced has a major impact on its taste and quality. I'm Niels Bernstein, food editor for Wine Enthusiast Magazine. Leila Schlack, senior associate editor, Wine Enthusiast Magazine. So I guess the most important thing to really clarify is what is terroir? What, is, what do we mean when we talk about terroir in wine as well as in food? So terroir is just this idea that the climate and the soil and, you know, the wind and the sun and all of these elements where, in the case of wine, grapes are grown, in the case of food, whatever food we're talking about is grown, all affect the flavor of it. Um, in wine, this is a given. This is something we've known and talked about for a long time. Uh, in food, we're really just starting to get into things like single origin chocolate and, you know, coffee labels telling you exactly where the coffee is from and how it's grown. Um, so terroir and food is is an emerging subject that we're paying a lot of attention to. Right. And I think it's an important point to make that when people talk about terroir, the word means soil. Yes. But we're not just talking about dirt. We're talking about all of the environmental factors, the climate, the water, like you said. And it's also, uh, to some degree, a uh, cultural thing, the traditions that have... Absolutely. How the food... I mean, in coffee, again, we see this a lot. You see shade-grown coffee. Um, so what does that mean? Well, that's coffee where the trees are scattered among other trees, so there's shade, and that impacts the flavor as well. Right. The um, I feel like terroir is something that's really been you know, it's really part of the psyche in places like France, Italy, Spain. When they talk about terroir, they're really talking about authenticity and regionality. It's not really something that, as you mentioned, where it's emerging in the U.S. for us to talk about uh, both wine and food in those terms. So what are some examples of some foods that are becoming more and more identified in terms of terroir? Right. Well, again, Chocolate and coffee are the big ones, and those are the ones we've been kind of seeing for a while. Um, it's a little bit of a false equivalency because both of those are products that go through so much processing after they're picked from their, you know, uh, they're roasted and um, chocolate is, you know, separated and there's a lot that happens to them after they're picked. Um, so you're not always just tasting the terroir. You're tasting right. all those other processes that happen. Um, but it is kind of a good intro to learning about uh, how different things grow in different places. Um, and also some of that comes down to different cultivars and varieties that grow better some places than others. So that's also not terroir. It's it's agricultural differences. Right. But it, it does relate to terroir in the sense that it's the, the quality of that particular micro region that is amenable to those specific cultivars of cacao or uh, right so you are still getting a sense of place from the flavor right right so talking about coffee and chocolate as an example i think about when i was uh really started to travel around the world in the 80s 90s and would go to europe and other places and the chocolate was something i really noticed as a huge chocolate fan you'd go to certain countries and the chocolate was it was it really varied from place to place. It wasn't as sweet as in the U.S. And it, it really had, there was such an incredible variety that's something that I think took years for us to really start seeing in the U.S. Right, yeah. I mean, for a long time, chocolate in the U.S. was a kind of uniform bar. It was Hershey's, which is fine. Um, but it's it's interesting to see people become educated about, oh, no, I like the Peruvian chocolate better or... Um, you know, I, I like I like my chocolate from Ecuador. Like, these are real conversations that people in the food world yeah. will have now because you can taste these chocolates from these different places, and, and side by side, just like you would with wine or olive oil or any of these other things, and really talk about the nuance and the difference between origins. And to see them labeled like that is so funny to me because you imagine if Hershey's when we were kids 
was labeled with its place of origin of right. the, the chocolate and the Tahitian vanilla or whatever. Right, it right. would have been completely ridiculous. Whereas now it's something people have come to really expect. Yes. And coffee kind of went through the same process. I feel like when I was younger, uh, coffee was from Colombia. Yes. Throughout Colombia, South America, for centuries, the people have gone to the marketplace. It is here that they trade. It is here that they buy their coffee. And, it was and, Juan Valdez, right? Yeah. And it's almost like we've gone through this process of narrowing down, narrowing down. So it's not even about what country it's from. It's from what what part of what country yes. and which farm and at what altitude. And it's it's just, I think it's really fascinating to see how that's progressed. Absolutely. And I mean, I, it's exciting. Like, I, I love Ethiopian coffee and it has such a distinct flavor to me. So it's just great being able to get that. It's nice that there's a market for it, um, that people know the difference and care and, and seek out these different varieties or locations. Yeah. I live in the West Village in New York and there's a place near me called Puerto Rico and they have coffees from all over the world. Right. There's about, at any given time, about a hundred. And even within the it has the country, the part of the country, how it's roasted, what style it is. And you can just go around and taste beans out of the big uh, burlap bags. Yeah. And uh, you see tourists go through there and locals and their minds are blown. You can see them even taking notes on their phone about what, uh, what their preferences are. And everybody that you go in there with has a different preference. Um, so another, I think... It, when we first started talking about terroir and food, uh, first thing that came to my mind was cheese. I mean, I'm a huge cheese freak, but that uh, you can talk about styles of cheese, but especially when you travel, you really, really notice the differences, even from village to village of yeah. cheeses. Yeah, that was a real revelation for me. I mean, when I was a kid and I was in Holland and I had um, an aged Gouda and, you know, it was the best thing I had ever tasted. And it was this revelation that, you know, cheese tastes very different in different places and from different places. Um, and as I've learned more about it, you know, it's, again, something that's not just about the soil uh, where the milk comes from, but also how the cheese is aged. Um, so you'll see increasingly not only, you know, this cheese is from this village in Vermont, you'll see, and it was cave aged in this type of cave. And, um, so there's, there's a lot to play with there. Yeah, there really is. The, the, um, there's, you know, the greatest mozzarella in the world is the mozzarella di Buffalo Campana. And they yes. say, it's not just that it's the water Buffalo milk. And it's not even just that the water Buffalo are entirely grass fed. It's the type of grass. And they try to make grass-fed water buffalo milk mozzarella elsewhere in the world and it just it just isn't the yeah, same yeah it's just not the same and it's frankly not as good and yeah, it's so hard yeah. to uh to kind of put a, a qualitative thing on something like that but it's so distinctive uh, and it's the kind of thing that you really need to taste it to kind of get it but it's that to me is such a good example of terroir in food it's not dirt but you're you're really tasting the grass, the grass that they're eating. Yeah. It's it's even through the whole cheese making process, you still get that taste and that quality. Yeah, for me, a really good example of terroir and cheese is blue cheeses from around the world. Mm. A lot of them are using that same Roquefort strain mm -hmm. um, to culture the cheese, but everything else is different. And so you come out with these dramatically different blue cheeses. Yeah. You know, between Roquefort and Stilton and American blues and um, and they're delicious, all of them. Yeah. So. <laughs> I just had one called uh, Chiraboga Blue, which is pretty widely available in the U.S. now. And it's made in Bavaria by a man from Ecuador who fell in love with a Bavarian woman and moved to Bavaria and wanted to make a blue cheese that had the character of where he was living in Bavaria. But again, he's using a Roquefort strain yeah. to make the cheese. And it's so distinctive. It's, inc it's exactly what you're talking about. It can't it's the best blue cheese I've ever tasted. You have to try it if you haven't. But it could only exist in Bavaria. There, yes. But at the same time, maybe his being from Ecuador and having been a cheesemaker there for years plays into it in some way as well. Right. He might have some technique that's not in use in Bavaria otherwise. Um, and it's it's such a parallel with wine where you can say that a certain region is a great place to 
to grow grapes, but without the the centuries of tradition and and the cultural specificity of the winemaking process. Yeah, that's uh, such an integral part of terroir. I think. Um, so we're talking about dairy and cheese and meat is another thing that has such a uh, uh, difference from place to place. You always hear Absolutely. about where they try to uh, a certain type of cattle in Italy and they try to raise it in the U.S. and they raise it exactly the same way and it's the genetic offspring of of the same cows from Italy and it just doesn't taste it's the same at all. It's just not the same, sure. And certainly with lamb, we see that a New Zealand lamb is always going to taste different than an American lamb. Um, yeah, and that that to me is also a kind of, it grows together. If it grows together, it goes together situation. Right, right. Like if, if you're in Italy and you're having, I think back to when I was in Piedmont and had this braised shank um, beef dish that, and with, with the local Barbera and it was just like perfect. It's yeah. just, it was the perfect pairing of foods and you know, the meat wasn't too rich and the wine wasn't too rich and they just had this affinity for each other and probably came from, you know, within five miles of each other also. Right. Um, so it's funny. It, you said w- what grows together goes together, which is a really popular wine and food pairing phrase and, yes. and philosophy. It's funny because I, There is an element of terroir to it that literally the wine that grows in a place and the food that is grown in a place might make sense together. But there's also kind of a romantic notion associated with it, too. There's an emotional connection that feels... Right. You want it to feel evocative. If you're serving a meal, you want to channel a sense of place. And so this idea of if it grows together, it goes together is a shortcut to doing that for sure. But I mean... The example I always think of when I hear that phrase is is um, Provence, and I think of you know there's this base of fennel and orange and olives that's common there, and you know that with the rosé, there's like a brightness and a salinity, um, but it also just feels nice and it feels kind of fancy and luxurious, and you know it feels like you're there. Yeah, it's as much a cultural thing as a agricultural thing. I think right. Yeah, it's um, I think about muscadet and oysters, of yep. course. Um, those big Argentinian Malbecs with their grass-fed beef. Yes, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's funny. Again, it's it's that kind of crossover between farming and culture. Yeah. That's interesting. I um, It's interesting when you travel around and talk to winemakers in different regions. They're almost – you. it's easy to forget that wine starts with farming. Right. They're growing grapes. Right. And I find that winemakers are as excited about – the food products that are growing in their regions as they are about their grapes. And I love that when you go to California and you go to Oregon and you go to Washington, so many of the winemakers, are, they're buddies with the farmers. You know, the, in Oregon, you'll, you have the hazelnut farm down the road and they're friends and they eat together and uh, because their their products complement each other, but also because they're doing the same kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing. They are doing the same kind of thing, and they like to... I mean, I've seen winemakers and farmers talking about, and the winemakers are getting really excited about the plums, and they right. want to know about what soil they grew in and when they... You know, what their process was in in coming to that. And it's, uh, it's a nice thing to remember that with winemaking, they're growing grapes. Yes. And they're farmers. Yeah. We haven't really talked about olive oil yet, but uh, it's interesting to me how many wineries also make olive oil. Yes. Yeah. It seems to be that olive trees grow well in the same conditions as grapevines. Um, And that's something where there is such huge difference from place to place. Um, Arbequina olives are the most commonly used olives for olive oil. And you can find Arbequina olive oil from California, from Italy, from Spain, from France, um, and from all of those places and from regions within those places. The olive oil is going to taste different. Yeah, that's such a good point. You have, you know, there's certain generalizations where Italian olive oil is very peppery or grassy and Greek olive oils are very full bodied and round. Right. And but um, But even within that, the same way with the wine, you go from from village to village, winery to winery, who are also making olive oil. And their olive oil would be completely different, as different as their wines. Yeah, and a lot of that also comes down to process and storage. Um, You know, we know that olive oil 
turns quickly, its flavors diminish quickly if it's stored improperly. Um, but I think the same is true for wine. You know, it's it's really the most analogous when we're talking about terroir. Yeah. I think um, talking about some of the, uh, we're talking about farming and soil. And so there's so many fruits and vegetables that are really specific to certain regions. Yeah. Um, there's the lemons of Sicily are famous. All the right, citrus right. from Sicily, really. Um, the Jersey potatoes from England, the pimenton chile from Spain. And I think people often think of those as a, a type of fruit or vegetable, but really it has as much to do with it being grown there as it does somewhere else. If you try to plant Sicilian lemon trees in California, they're not going to taste the same and yeah. they're not going to be prolific. Right. Um, well, so I was just actually going to say here in the Northeast, in the summer, we look forward to Jersey tomatoes, right? We have a two to three week window of jer- field grown Jersey tomatoes. Um, and you can grow the same type of tomatoes hydroponically, but they're not going to taste the same. Um, and, you know, that's also something I think of when I was traveling in Turkey and I had the f- my favorite thing I ate that, that whole trip was a whole tomato that had just been charred on the outside over the fire. And that was it. And it was just like that's this amazing. perfect appetizer yeah i had when i was in turkey they have this like minced uh kind of minced vegetable green relish Mm -hmm. and it's the kind of thing that you instantly think oh this is great i'll be able to replicate this at home and i've tried 20 30 times and it's just not the same and it never will be the same because those aren't the same uh vegetables it's not the same products and it's funny i was actually able to talk to someone there who's involved in the agriculture and they're very nonchalant about it. They just have great growing conditions for a lot of things. And so they don't um, they don't take a lot of extra, extra steps that farmers elsewhere take. They're just kind of like, yeah, we plant the thing and it grows and then we eat it and it's delicious. Right. You know? well, it's like when you go to a market in Italy and it's so abundant and beautiful and the best produce you've ever seen, but maybe they only have two things. Yes. Because that's yeah. what it, what's in season. And yeah. they don't give it much thought. It's just this is... This is What's what we best have now. Yeah. Why wouldn't we eat the best thing and the type of mushroom that grows the best at this time in this place? Well, and those seasons are fleeting too. So again, with the Jersey tomatoes, like that's all I eat for three weeks. You know, that's how long I have them. Right. It's um, avocados are a great illustration, and maybe something as they seem to be getting more and more expensive that people are thinking <laughs> a lot about now, but. Um, People, you go to Mexico and people are like, why is this guacamole so great? I can't, you know, how do, what do they do to it? And really they do nothing to it. Right. It's the same Haas avocado. It just is growing in different conditions in Mexico yeah. than it is in California. And if you go to markets there, they really, there's a lot of different types of avocados. There's, and there's a, if you talk to the people selling them, they're making a distinction, not just about the type of avocado or that it's from the North or the South, but they're really drilling down into what town it's from. Yeah. Because they, presumably, people understand that and care about that there. Yeah. I think the thing that's most exciting to me about this whole idea that we in the U.S. are starting to talk about terroir as it relates to food is it it really is kind of reestablishing that connection between farmers and ingredients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny because now we don't necessarily talk about our walnuts are grown in the Central Valley of California and our cranberries are grown in Wisconsin and this apple comes from Eastern Washington. But in restaurants, you you really do see that now, not just in New York and LA and right. certain places. You see the menus, they're saying exactly what farm they got it from, what type of, of pistachio it is and what farm it came from and why they... Yeah. And so it's interesting to see that conversation kind of happening from the restaurant side and and trickling down into our consciousness that way. And it makes so much sense for the restaurants too. To, I mean, the menus are changing constantly with what's in season and it really allows the chefs to go each morning and get the freshest products and craft dishes around them. Um, so it's, it's exciting for them. They're not cooking the same thing every night. It's such a, uh, it's interesting though, because it's kind of a marketing term as well. You yes. know, it's like, okay, it's farm to table, but is it, it, it was it ripe? You know, is right. the farm, do, do they have good practices? Right. You know, I think there's so much talk about like uh, local, seasonal, et cetera, but I feel like I've started to see more people, restaurants going maybe a little bit away from being hyper local, hyper seasonal to just getting the best possible ingredients yeah. they can. And there's certainly, 
both happening. I, it's become a joke with me that, you know, in the in the neighborhood I'm moving to in a few weeks, um, all, there are a lot of restaurants around. And whenever anyone asks me, so what type of, re- you know, what type of food does that place serve? What type of restaurant is that? The go-to for all of these places is, oh, you know, it's locally grown new American blah, blah food. Right. Exactly. It's, new food. Yeah. Local seasonal farm-to-table. Contemporary right, right, right. farm-to-table blah, blah food. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> and it's, uh, I think, you know, you have, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, that threw me off a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I, you know, we're, we're kind of starting to, uh, well, we kind of do it all year as we start to kind of bandy about ideas for the restaurant issue and the 100 best wine restaurants that comes out late summer. And it's so interesting to see how it's, it's shifted a little bit from that idea of a farm to table and the hyper local thing is, is kind of taking on a different character now. And I think it, it does relate to, I find people are, are less concerned about something being local than using products that really speak of where they're from, whether it's yeah. some olive oil, meat, cheese, produce, herbs, nuts. Well, and like you said, grown or harvested under good practices. Um, right. You know, I think within that being interesting still trumps all, but that's also an area where the wine list becomes really important. So if you're trying to stay local or trying to channel a sense of place, I think a lot of wine directors are are following that cue and, and focusing their lists around it as well. I think we're definitely seeing that. And that's, I mean, another thing is we're talking about the restaurant issue. These, I, to me, the, the, the restaurants and the wine programs that are the most exciting are where the wine really relates yeah. to the food in a, in a literal sense, in a taste sense, but in an emotional sense too. You want the passions of the wine staff and the passions of the kitchen to relate to each other. Yeah. I mean, I love me a nice, tight, focused wine list I where I too. know that, you know, it's all going to go together, that they're not catering to, well, someone might come in who likes this type of wine. So we need to have this type of wine, even if it doesn't really relate to our food. Right. They're saying, no, we're picking the wines that relate to our food. Well, and you see it happening with, you know, the same way that, you know, we used to have Italian restaurants in the U.S. Then we started getting, quote unquote, authentic Italian restaurants. And now we have these very, very regional Italian restaurants that now have these equally focused wine lists. And yes. I think it's just, it's super exciting. And it's it's really, I think, changing the way that we're kind of thinking about food and, and wine. Well, and it's also interesting going back to this idea of terroir of food. So there are places that will have, right, a hyper-regional Italian cuisine and an Italian wine. But they're also highlighting that they're using their locally grown products that are not from Italy because right. we're in the States. So they're kind of putting their own spin on these dishes just by using ingredients that are grown in a different place. Well, we have that piece in the new issue on Sicilian cuisine, yes. which there's a pesto that's uh, almonds and tomatoes. Yeah. And in Sicily, when you have that, it's just remarkable. But when I was talking to Sicilian chefs, they were like, don't use Sicilian, don't use canned tomatoes, don't use Sicilian. Sicilian tomatoes and Sicilian almonds use the very best, freshest tomatoes and almonds you can find wherever you are. Right. And that's so, it's kind of the, what's more authentic or what speaks of Sicilian food more. Is it, uh, is it the recipe or is it the integrity of the ingredients? Yeah. And it's really the latter. Yeah. And again, that, that goes to just eating being an emotional experience more right. than anything. And, and you want your food to be evocative. So beyond eating being an emotional experience, it's also, especially these days with climate change and environmental concerns, a uh, political one as well yes. to some degree. Yeah. So, you know, as we start talking about uh, hydroponics, uh, vertical gardening, right. there's these ways of growing our fruits and vegetables without dirt. Right. So what happens to, I keep, of course, I'm so uh, pro anything that allows us to uh, grow more food uh, in an environmentally With friendly impacts, way. Sure. But what happens to terroir when that happens? Yeah, I mean, it's completely stripping terroir away right there's there's no soil involved it's in a temperature controlled space right it could be anywhere it could be anywhere um i think an interesting thing that's happening though is is that people growing with these methods are breeding more selectively so 
No, it's not going to have the same sense of place as, you know, a lush Turkish tomato, but it is going to be, you know, a tomato that's bred for sweetness and, and density and all of those right. desirable traits. You just don't want every tomato bred for sweetness and... Right, you want to have You want to maintain diversity. Yeah. I think that's what's so interesting to me about the GMO debate. To me, it's not about... It's not whether GMOs are good or bad. It's that diversity is good. Yeah. So however that plays out, I think it's so important to maintain diversity. And at least, and that's part of terroir is this kind of the millions of strains of every carrot that exist all over the place. Yeah. Um, and it's also uh, this whole hydroponic and, and greenhouse growing um topic is is also analogous to wine when you hear people talk about you know oh we make good wine in the field versus we have winemakers who are very hands-on right right it's, right totally you it's know instead same, of farming the grapes the you're, you're crafting it in a controlled environment right and they would never i mean of, of course winemakers in the wine world would shudder at the idea of of restricting the diversity of grapes yes but there's so much i mean it's happening you know yeah. in in mexico it's uh there's a saying there called uh, sin maíz no hay país. Without corn, there's no country. Yeah. And there's so much of the land that's been turned over to very single strains of high-yielding corn that foreign corporations are growing in Mexico. And it's really, it's become a major political issue there because they feel if they lose that genetic diversity of corn, how does that affect national identity? Right. And that's a, well... Maybe a topic for another podcast, but <laughs> it's so fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, okay, I have a question for you. Okay. Everyone says, of course, pizza's great in Italy. You can have a brick oven here. You can do everything the same way, but it won't taste the same way as Italy. People love to say that it's the water. What do you think? Um, it's not just the water, but the water for sure plays a role. So I currently live in New Haven, Connecticut. Um mm -hmm. It's also known for its pizza. Maybe not quite so much as Italy, but probably second to Italy, I'd What's say, your favorite right? pizzeria in New Haven? You know, I usually go to Modern just because oh. it's... So the the big two are Sally and Peppy's. And right. Modern's uh, Johnny Come Lately, but it's up there with those two. Modern's just easier. There's, okay. So all right. they all do a great job. Um, they're all brick oven. Uh, New Haven, unlike a lot of cities, will allow people to build new brick ovens. You don't have to be grandfathered in. There's no limited supply of brick ovens in the city. But, um, And it's all very thin crust pizza. And when I moved there, the first time I tried to make pizza, I thought something was wrong with my yeast because the dough barely rose. Hmm. Um, but, you know, I'd gotten that far, so I made the pizza anyway. And again, it came out with this thin crackery crust that is New Haven pizza, not in a brick oven. You know, I didn't have quite the same right. char on it. But um, the water there is very hard. And to me, that's there's no way that that doesn't play a role. And, you know, and because the water is hard, I had to rise it for longer. So then it ferments a little bit more. Um, with something like pizza, it's, it's also going to be how you handle the dough and your skill with that, um, how thin you, you know, how thin right. you toss it. But... Again, f hearing about the pizza in Italy and talking about the pizza in Italy, so much of it comes down to that idea of the sense of place and it just being, you know, this kind of magical experience of yeah. eating pizza in the home of pizza. Yeah, it's that they know what they're doing. Yeah. I was like, we can just, we can make hard water pizza. We can use Evian. Right. And make pizza, but it won't be the same. Right. But that's interesting about your New Haven experiment. I never would have uh, put that much stock in the importance of the water but yeah no it's the water for sure plays a role and the and the climate as well mm -hmm. um you know just temperature and humidity are going to affect how it's going to rise um it's also kind of an interesting look at terroir of a finished dish versus an ingredient right right, right? i was in a uh, beer store the other day and the uh, the guy i was talking to there was saying how he mentioned the terroir of beer yeah. I was like, oh, what do you mean the grains? Like, no, not the grains, the water. Yeah. I was like, oh, I never really, of course, the, the water has a major impact in right. the, it's one of the main taste and quality of yeah. beer. But it was so interesting because I assumed it would be the, he's like, no, the, the terroir of hops and grains don't really transmit, but the water really does. And he was saying, you know, a lot of parts of the country, 
that have these really great craft beer scenes in the U.S., it's because they have incredibly – their water has a certain, a certain quality to it that lends itself to their beer being distinctive. Was he able to talk more about what that was? Like, are there certain minerals? That's what or? I was. I was like, is it just delicious? Is right. it soft or hard? Is it is it tasty? And he didn't really have an answer. And he said Fair he enough. didn't want to speak for them because he wasn't sure if, you know, how they would characterize that. But I thought it was a, it was an interesting point because with terroir, I always go to, you know, knowing how how many things play into it, I still think about plants and dirt. Right, right. And uh, that was an interesting thing. Well, and I also, now that we're talking about alcoholic beverages, I also... <laughs> we're in the tasting room at right, Wine Enthusiast yeah, yeah. after we're all. we're surrounded hard, by wine. hard not to. Um, I also go a lot to aging and what the, you know, when it's not in a totally controlled environment, how that plays a role. So, um, you know, with spirits, like when you look at scotch, scotch that's... A, that's where the barley is malted and that is aged in kind of wetter environments has mm-hmm. a very different flavor to it right than than scotch that you know is from drier parts of Scotland um, so some of that is the grain and how it's processed and malted but some of that is is just the air it's literally right. it's just that, the air the microclimate that yeah. it's existing in it's like when I've traveled around uh, southern Mexico to visit mezcal producers, mm-hmm. um, that's an example where it really is the plant. Yes. And it's, those plants take, you know, usually a minimum of 10 years to, to ripen to the point that yeah. they can harvest them and make mezcal. And so you're really getting, it's not just, you're getting decades of terroir in every, uh, in every plant. And because there's so little done to it in the distillation, the fermentation and distillation process, you really get, I find that those producers attribute everything to the plant and the earth and that those years of growing rather than to the, the roasting, the fermentation and the distillation, which is maybe different from Scotch producers. For sure. Example. So now when they roast the, the plant to make the mezcal, is it, always the same type of fire like I wonder how big a role that plays what they're burning to yeah, roast it and they also usually it's uh it's roasting for several days in the earth yes. so it's actually being cooked in the dirt so again it's which is near soil, where it was yeah. grown so <laughs> and and rocks and you know everything that the the natural materials that they're using to roast it that all feeds into it as well and then you have if they're fermenting out in the open, you have the natural yeah. yeast. And, and so, again, in that way, it, it, that's an example of a spirit that really has a lot of commonality with wine. Yes. Thanks so much, Layla. It's so fun talking to a fellow food freak about this topic. Let's go get a bite to eat. Visit us at WineEnthusiast.com to browse the latest trends in wine gadgets and wine decor. That's Wine Enthusiast Catalog at WineEnthusiast.com, where we've got everything but the wine. This podcast is produced by Large Media, L-A-R-J Media. Wine Enthusiast is made possible by grapes, sunshine, and wine. And by the hardworking editors who bring you news and information on your favorite beverage every day. If you like what we're doing, share our podcast with your friends and give us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. For more fun wine information, follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Wine Enthusiast.